Mishal Hussain Malik, the wife of Yasin Malik, in the cabinet of the caretaker government. Now, we all know who Yasin Malik is. He's the man who has been found guilty in a terror funding case for supporting unlawful activities. He was convicted by an NIA court here in the national capital and right now he is in Tihar jail, the premier prison in this country, spending perhaps the rest of his life for all the wrongdoings that he committed. Now, the question is, what message is Pakistan attempting to convey? Here is the wife of a convicted terrorist who is being rewarded and that too as a special ambassador for human rights. I mean, think about that for a second. Think about the irony of that for a second. The special ambassador for human rights is the wife of a convicted terrorist. What message is Pakistan trying to send? What message is the caretaker government trying to send to India? That any anti-India activity, anyone who indulges in anti-India activity will be rewarded? And if that's the message, then how should India reciprocate? पाकिस्तान का मामला है पाकिस्तान जो करना चाहे उसके लिए मुझे क्या कहना है वो हम दो मुल्कों की बात है आप तो गुजारिश करते हैं बात है कि एक कंट्राडिक्शन है एक तरफ से अगर वो ह्यूमन राइट्स के लिए कंसर्न है दूसरी तरफ से उस शख्स को इस जगह पर तैनात करते हैं जिसके हस्बैंड मिलिटेंसी में इन्वॉल्व हैं So if ever there was any proof required that Pakistan does not have the best interests of either Kashmir or of India in its mind when it makes some of these decisions, this is a classic example. The wife of a convicted terrorist, a terrorist who is spending time in the Tihar jail, is being rewarded with a governmental position and all the perks that come with it and it's not just any position, it's the position of special envoy on human rights, then why should India even think of meeting Pakistan halfway? Kavinder Gupta is the former Deputy Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir. Saifuddin Soz is Senior Congress Leader, former Union Minister. Uh, we're also joined by SP Ved, the former DGP of Jammu and Kashmir. Mona Alam is a Senior Journalist uh, joining us from Pakistan. And Lalit Ambardar is a Kashmiri activist uh, who will also be joining us. Uh, let me go to Kavinder Gupta first. Kavinder Ji, ye ki, uh, Kavinder Gu All right, Saifuddin Soz, the decision that's been taken uh, by the Pakistan caretaker administration to reward the wife of a convicted terrorist, what do you make of that? No, first you wanted Mr. Kavinder to say something. All right, you have moved to me. I tell you, I have a feeling in my heart and mind. I condemn all kind of terrorism. There is a different story. Here, there are two individuals, Mr. Yasin Malik, who is in jail, and his, his wife, who is in Pakistan. There are two individuals. You can't mix his wife with him and, you see, start clubbing them together and punishing them. I have no brief for anybody. I condemn terrorism. Yasin Malik, Yasin Malik is behind the bars. Law will take its own course ultimately. But his wife is a Pakistani. You can't club her with Yasin Malik and jointly punish them. It may be verbal punishment, it will be propaganda, it may be any physical harm to them. You must understand that she is a Pakistani woman. She is an individual. You assess her performance on ground all by yourself. Do something and know her better. Here is Yasin Malik, who, who is behind the bars, and uh, he is facing law. Law has taken his course. So these are two separate individuals. What if she is wife of Yasin Malik? You can't club them together and punish them under no law. 
in any country. So, so sir, I, I just want to clarify, you know, uh, I, I'm very surprised by the, the position you've taken tonight. So, I want to know if this is your individual position or this is the position of the Congress party in Jammu and Kashmir that these are two separate individuals and the, the ills or sins of one cannot be considered the sins of the other. No, I don't speak for the Congress party. I'm a congressman. Okay. But whatever idea I express is my idea, not Congress party's. I am not a designated, you see, uh, office holder of Congress party. Okay. I'm an individual. I had been minister. I had been MP. This is my idea, not the Congress party's idea. Okay. They will fix the responsibility sure. with a spoke, the spokesperson. I I'm not this, the spokesperson. Yeah, yeah. The reason I ask this, and I'll I'll go to SP Vaidsav after this, and then Mona Alam, Lalit Ambadar is also there. Kavinder Gupta is there, the former Deputy Chief Minister. Uh, SP Vaidsav. So Soz Saab is saying that you know why is the media going overboard? These are two separate individuals. You can't hold the wife accountable for the litany of sins of the husband. But sir, pray may I ask? It's not like Mishal Malik uh, has covered herself in, in glory entirely. Just a few weeks ago, she undertook a rally, a protest march in Karachi against the holding of the G20 meeting in Srinagar. This was the tourism meeting, I think, happened in May, uh, last week of May. She took out a rally opposing that, saying that, you know, all kinds of things which are not uh, bearing in fact or which, are, which have no bearing on the ground saying how the G20 meeting should not happen in Srinagar. Now it's a different matter, it's a separate matter that that meeting happened, it was very successful, delegates from all around the world came, they attended that meeting. Now still this argument that's being put forth that the wife cannot be held accountable for the sins of the husband. Now pray explain to me how does that work, especially in light of you know this rally that she, un uh, that she took out uh, some weeks ago. Evening, uh, I have a lot of regard for uh, Professor Sabuddin Sos, and I had the honor of uh, uh, having his company many times. But uh, my views on this are a little uh, more from the police perspective and uh, from the perspective of a, 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 a soldier from the nation. Uh, see, uh, today's uh, this news. Yeah, the interim government has been made by the establishment in Pakistan. You know, um, uh, Mushal Malik is not a uh, from a very prominent party and not a prominent leader. But uh, all uh, you know, the interim government has been made at the behest of the establishment. And uh, by today's action, they have confirmed that she was mole of the ISI. If you recall, when uh, her marriage took place. There were uh, uh, murmurs of uh, she being an ISI mole, and uh, today's action confirms that. Number one, number two, Pakistan sends a very clear message that uh, they are not interested in improving relations with India. So uh, this is uh, uh, Mushal Malik has been, it, uh, uh, you know, she has been spewing venom against the country, against India, and. Uh, uh, by this, uh, the message from the establishment of Pakistan, who calls the chart in pa charts in Pakistan, is very clear that in spite of people of Pakistan suffering and in spite of complete bankruptcy of the economy, uh, people of Pakistan, 24 crore people who are suffering uh, for various reasons, okay. and they all want Pakistan to improve relations with India. Uh, otherwise, uh, look at the uh, inflation there. The India being very close, the closest neighbor, they could import many things at cheaper prices. But Pakistan's establishment doesn't seem to be interested, and the message is very, very clear that there is no change of heart in the establishment, and they do not want any improvement in relations. With so, India. so let me ask Mona Alam this, I, I'm just trying to understand, you know, what is the thinking, what is the process behind the awarding of this special ambassador position on human rights to the wife of a convicted terrorist? Let's say, for example, if India were to reward the same position to the wife of Sirajuddin Haqqani or the wife of Nurwali Mesood or the wife of Omar Khalid, 
you know, would that be acceptable to Pakistan? Would that be okay? Uh, you know, India has our best interests in mind. Uh, actually, Zaka, um, India has done a lot worse. I mean, uh, the re revocation of uh, Article 35A and 370 from Kashmir, that too unilaterally without taking the public in confidence. No, what has that this got to do with Pakistan? What? One second, that, those were provisions of the Indian constitution. What on earth does no, it have to do I with mean, Pakistan? Zaka, actually, they were in conflict with UN resolutions on Kashmir and we, we all know it like the back of our hand. And uh, I mean, you cannot say that, you cannot say how, that. How and was it I in conflict with UN resolutions? Uh, anyway, that's not my question even. My question is, I'm giving you no, a comparable but, but example. If, yes. if the wife of a convicted terrorist in your country, and admittedly she's a Pakistani national, has been rewarded with this position of ambassador for human rights, would it be okay with Pakistan if India were to do the same to the wife of Sirajuddin Haqqani or the wife of uh, Omar Malik or uh, the wife of Noor Wali Mehsood? Would that be acceptable to you? Uh, yes, I think it would be because it would you know, be. of course, the, okay. it would be because yes. Let me let me uh, take my uh, give my reason for mm -hmm. this because of course this is our internal matter. This is Pakistan's internal matter. One of our uh, esteemed panelists has rightly pointed out that she's a Pakistani citizen. Okay. Uh, to you, she is the wife of a convict, but to Pakistan, she's a human rights activist and uh, nothing nothing other than that. What has she done to, uh, to get that uh, moniker Kashmir of itself. human rights activist? What's her claim to fame? Like, has she freed uh, people who are persecuted, religious persecution? We had, you know, eight churches she... being burnt recently, just a, a few days ago, just yesterday. Eight churches have been burnt. Did Mishal Malik appear at those churches and fight for the rights of the Christians whose churches have been burnt? Like, what is her claim to fame? Like, how is she a human Actually, rights you... activist? Um, um, I mean, our audience may not be privy to this information, but uh, the the prime minister of the same cabinet that Vishal Malik is a part of had convened a very urgent meeting on the matter. He had spoken to the community and uh, also, you know, uh, I would take the opportunity, take this opportunity to remind the churches that have been been burned recently in India as well. So no, no, you know, uh, that's not no my question. Even my question is, what is of, no, Mishal no, no, Malik's claim yourself, to be awarded uh, a special ambassador for human rights position? What other human rights causes has she taken up? Is what I want to know. I think, yes, I think she's a very prominent voice national on on a national level and as well as an uh, on an international level okay. when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, abiding UN resolutions on Kashmir. She's been extremely vocal about it. She's she's been. Uh, you know the key key speaker in in seminars abroad in Pakistan as well and abroad as well, mm -hmm. and obviously she has a good base in London too. So she is okay. she's been very so vocal. So Lalit she has a base in London. She's been a speaker on the international on circuit. She goes to UNHRC. She goes to Geneva. All of those stuff. She takes out rallies against G20 in Srinagar. All of these are claims for why Mashal Malik deserves to be the ambassador for human rights and. The other part, which is that you can't hold or berate or crucify the wife for the sins of the husband. Please respond. Zaka, on that account, I have all the pity or uh, sympathy for this woman who, who was a budding artist and she had the audacity to, to, to draw her self nudes in that Islamic conservative Pakistan. But she was made a cannon fodder by uh, her own father who happened to be a uh, member of Pakistan Muslim League and she was in a, she was intentionally married of Yasin Malik Jihadis who they knew he's going to be hanged one day in India only to seek, uh, see to it that a, a pan-Islamic movement around Kashmir Jihad is consolidated in Pakistan because that's the only thing that can keep, the, keep, keep Pakistan I I I integrated. You today only the whole Pashtun Tahafuz movement, about about lakhs of Pashtuns were on the streets of Islamabad fighting against uh, uh, the injustice being done to them. They want to they, they are against Durand line. Then you have uprising in uh, Blochistan. The only way they can keep the Pakistan together, I don't know how long they're going to do it, is on the verge of implosion that they can only consol consolidate the opinion of Kashmir Pakistan in the name of Islam and what best then Kashmir Jihad. You remember? On 14th of August 1947, Pakistan was born and they always claim historically they had nothing to eat on that particular day. And the following day, they start a war against India. That was Kashmir Jihad 1. They had the audacity to do it. The Pakistanis have not come from heaven. Please understand, it's not a normal state. 
we are expecting a normal behavior from a uh, from a state which is not no, 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 normal state you know on 14th of august 2000, 1947 indian born uh, indians millions of india born they, uh, they, they, they 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 create they they, they breached the trust of their motherland and uh, went for pakistan's uh, jinnah's true nation theory in the name of islam and created pakistan and it was on the dead bodies and till then since then the only agenda of pakistan is kashmir and they have repeatedly said it everybody who has been in islamabad or in all pindi they have been always constantly saying that kashmir is our target only because kashmir is a muslim uh, majority state and it's the unfinished task of uh, uh, partition we are like mr saifuddin souls i remember last time i, I have seen him in, in india in the center he was uh, the host of uh, kasuri okay. kasuri was sitting in indian international center threatening us Threatening us, you resolve Kashmir, otherwise we will not be able to hold jihadis for long. I have to check Mr. Sajid's goals when he called Pakistan occupied Kashmir and Pakistan administered Kashmir. Okay. These are, these, they have, they have pan these sentiments. S Kashmir's mainstream has the same thing. So I know, no, I, uh, Mashal herself, Mashal herself, she has been spewing, has been rightly pointed out, she has been spewing venom against her, not only her. Yeah. She is again using her own small daughter to use the same thing. No, so as I, I understand, and I could be wrong on, 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 on this, on this uh, fact, but uh, my understanding is, and this has been given by our research desk, that Yasin Malik's sole purpose in marrying uh, Mishal Malik, and I believe she was a minor when the, when the marriage happened, this was way back in the, in the 1990s, the sole purpose was to ensure that this whole narrative of Kashmiri yahan pe bhi hai, Kashmiri wahan pe bhi hai, and if you have one Kashmiri from here and one Kashmiri from there, then they won't be able to separate that bond. That was his sole idea and intent in marrying a minor from that region. But be that as it may, Kavinder Gupta is also joining us. Uh, and I believe uh, he's just been patched through. He's the former Deputy Chief Minister of the State of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Yasin Malik ki patni ko, uh, Mishal Malik ko, Pakistan ki sarkar ne, abhi abhi unko special director human rights ka jo pad hai, wo uh, unko diya hai. आ, इसके ऊपर आपका क्या प्रतिक्रिया है आ, भारत सरकार की तरफ से क्या रवैया होनी चाहिए क्या आ, एक्शन होनी चाहिए इसके खिलाफ देखिए पाकिस्तान की सरकार जा, आ, जानती है कि यासिन मलिक ने हिंदुस्तान में बहुत से कत्लेआम करवाए हैं बहुत सी वारदातें ऐसे कराई हैं आतंकवाद को बढ़ाया है और खास करके कई बार जहाजों को अगवा करने का भी इसने काम किया है तो भारत को इरिटेट करने का ये एक कोशिश इसने की है और खास करके ये भी मैं कहना चाहूंगा कि पाकिस्तान में सरकार नाम की तो कोई चीज होती नहीं है वहां तो ये आर्मी और आईएसआई यही सरकारें चलाते हैं इनकी मर्जी से सरकारें चलाते चलती है तो संभावित बात है कि इस चीज आज पाकिस्तान में जिस प्रकार से एक केयर टेकर सरकार बनी है तो उसमें इस प्रकार का पद देकर के वो भारत को क्या बतलाना चाहता है हम ये पूछना चाहते हैं इससे भारत को कोई फर्क पड़ने वाला नहीं है लेकिन वो खुद ब खुद पूरे विश्व भर में विश्व पटल पर अपने जो पहले ही बहुत कृतिक करा चुका है इवन जो मुस्लिम देश है वो उसकी परवाह नहीं करते हैं अभी हाल ही में पंद्रह अगस्त को जिस प्रकार से दुबई में उनकी हालत हुई है लेकिन Uh, मुझे लगता है कि विश्व भर में uh, ये आतंकवाद को लेकर के सभी सीरियस हैं सभी बड़े देश हैं और uh, उसके कारण से इसने इस प्रकार का प्रयास किया है क्योंकि भारत को असर होने वाला नहीं है नो सो आई कम बैक टू कविंदर गुप्ता आई वॉन्ट गो बैक टू सो साहब सो साहब यू नो वेन यासिन मलिक मैरिड दिस लेडी मुशाल मलिक इन टू शी वॉज नॉट नोन एज सम काइंड ऑफ अमन राइट एक्टिविस्ट और इट वॉज नॉट नोन her political views were not known she was an artist who apparently at that time was painting nudes now her artistic creations used to often time you know irk religious sentiments or stir religious sentiments which of course in pakistan everybody knows is a very sensitive matter therefore she used to in secret and in underground depict her artwork so much so that yasin malik who claims to be you know this this leader of the separatist movement this leader of who's upholding uh, uh, the islamic ideology in in kashmir he did not have a problem with all of this back when they met and in marrying her but suddenly 
after his arrest and his conviction and and him now being in tihar jail over the last many years she has been leading uh, you know human rights marches after human rights marches for a convicted terrorist but you want to go into her private life she is a citizen of pakistan okay on her own volition she married yasin malik that is a private affair we we can't comment on that how they got married and she was not a minor of that i am sure so a pakistan how uh, mushal malik spends her life in pakistan i have never bothered in such matters in my life broadly i wish india and pakistan to live together as best neighbors and that will happen one day i am an optimist no no so but sir, these, uh, for that for uh, that to happen issues, i look to that future sir sir give me give me 10 seconds but for now, that to happen for a semblance of normalcy a modicum of normalcy and i agree with you right now it's not a normal relationship it has to be a normal relationship for yes. that the basic underlying understanding between both countries needs to be that terrorists or enabling persons for terrorists should not be condoned on either side why is that no, such no, a hard India thing to agree condone. upon no the question is we can formulate a policy here and live by that policy put put that policy into practice but pakistan is a different situation it is another country and mashal malik is a pakistani we have no access to her private life and at least i am not available to give her advice but i wish her well no, no so i am not even getting into that, in that all i'm saying is do in harmony if there are two neighbors right both let's say have an intent to live in harmony but one person is always using yes. a lathi or a danda or a gun to threaten the other person kill the other person's relatives and kin and so on then that's not a normal relationship right the basis of a normal relationship has to be you. mutual respect has to be that you know i'm not going to yes. use the instrument of terrorism to target your people just because you happen to be a smaller military or economic power i mean those are basic facts please, if those please, basic please underlying sort of please. acknowledgements can't uh, underpin this relationship then then what's the point of trying no, to no, attempt a normal please relationship please listen to me for half a minute yes sir i yes, wish sir. and pray that india and pakistan you in cordial relationship i pray for that and if i have to work for that i will work for that goal but here and now india and pakistan are not cordial so this is why i cannot convey any message to mashal she is she is not an, a kid she is a human rights activist recognized say beyond hmm. pakistan so it is for her to decide just a minute i have no, no access to yasin will it be advised you know all of us want a normal relationship just, but you can't have a normal relationship yes. by conferring you know ministerial positions to the wife of a convicted terrorist i'm sorry i don't think that's how normal relationships work let it zaka zaka as much as i no, have as much as i studied pakistan as much as i know about it as much i have studied so i follow the jihad movements around the world looking pursuing peace with pakistan is like chasing mirage every time you tend to extend a hand of friendship they always stab you in the back we don't realize it kashmiri islam i said mainstream kashmir is a kashmiri islamist they want to have a uh, distance they want to create they want to have a wider distance between delhi and srinagar want to come closer to rawal pindi just because pakistan ka rishta kya lai lai lala ask mr sos is he okay with uh, this mashal and her little daughter being used by the pakistan administration in pakistan and around the world to spew venom against india is he okay with that do i have no do we no, don't we have right to counter it she is a pakistani citizen so is hafiz said now listen to me as hafiz said the terrorist okay she is also she is a terrorist she is using her voice voice to to voice to to demonize india to to demonize india defend india are mr sos are you happy with it are you okay with it so sir quick quick response i need to no, go to some of the other guests as well i can I cannot be I cannot be happy with that
बट आई हैव नो एक्सेस टू मिशाल टू टेल हर सो आर यू हैप्पी विद यासीन मलिक हु हैज हु हैज हु हैज बीन इन्वॉल्व्ड इन जेनोसाइड ऑफ कश्मीरी हिंदू हु हैज बीन इन्वॉल्व्ड इन स्टार्टिंग द साइकिल ऑफ ब्लड एंड डिस्ट्रक्शन इन कश्मीर आर यू हैप्पी यू ट्रेंड यू ट्राई टू कॉल मिस्टर यासीन मलिक आई हैव नेवर बीन ही हैज ही हैज टू बी हैंग 30 इयर्स अगो आई कैन नॉट बी इन एग्रीमेंट विद यासीन मलिक 30 इयर्स अगो यू गो ऑन से ओके कश्मीर इज ब्लिंग ओके लेट मी लेट मी लेट मी कॉल फॉर अ पॉज हियर लेट मी कॉल फॉर अ पॉज हियर वंस अगेन यू नो मोना आलम आई एप्रिशिएट यू यासीन मलिक Once again, you okay. know, every time an administration in Pakistan under Nawaz Sharif, under uh, you know Imran Khan, whenever there is this attempt to try and reach out, make some kind of normalcy with the administration here in India, you know, uh, we've been saying that you know ultimately the army is what calls the shots in Pakistan, and the army will always be two steps back, one step forward when it comes to India-Pakistan relations, including in General Bajwa's time, which probably was the. the 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 one singular time when pakistan wanted to have a normal relationship but this episode around mashal malik has once again illustrated to india that ultimately even in a caretaker government you know the army calling the shots and saying that the wife of a convicted terrorist will be given not just any position not you know interior secretary not you know defense secretary position of special ambassador for the office of human rights I mean come on are we, who are we kidding that the military wants to have some kind of normal ties with india Z- zaka i i suspect this is for me um i yeah. think this is the most the most apt thing to do i have uh, she is a human rights activist and all that is being claimed here i take strong exception to her private life her, her personal life being discussed in this manner as such she being alleged of being you know a minor when she was married i think this is a very flammable and a very sorry accusation upon a lady and it doesn't go well with with you know the stature of this debate and uh, the kind of seniors who who are in this debate uh, i'm very sorry to hear all this me being a woman i would take strong exception and i would really want to protest against this and having said that you know it's always it's always a point that we need to make there are grievances on either side if you say a normal a normal relationship between two countries uh has to be the one where both of them are uh, of them are making you know efforts to move uh, towards each other or to move towards betterment or to or to move towards normalcy uh then you know i mean there are there are a lot of cases i mean i quoted you what india had done in 2019 5th of august uh revoking those special articles on kashmir Again, this is this is not something that one has nothing to do with the other uh it is not a, a, a an a, a, a provision of the pakistan i mean people like no, mehbooba mufti so, ma'am, 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 ma'am. For, it is not an article it is not an article right of the constitution of pakistan that was amended or that was that india. was removed it was an article of the constitution of india right and the very government fair, of india the fair. parliament fair. of india not But, the government of india the parliament of india through majority is well within its right to amend or remove any article of any constitution uh, any uh, entire, uh, uh, amend any article in the constitution of in india the, the, that that's a separate matter the, the, the legality of it is, is being challenged in the supreme court the supreme court is apprised of that matter what i'm asking you is i'm asking you a simple what question the worst the in, worst in, terror in attack court, Zaka, uh, uh, hear me out hear, hear me out mona 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 hear me out i'm yes, willing please, to meet you please. halfway right the worst terror attack terrorism is terrorism is terrorism right knows no True. color True. knows no uh, boundaries B- the worst attack that happened on pakistani soil in recent times when i mean recent in the last let's say decade was the aps school attack right the army public school attack in which children were killed a large number of children were killed over 150 were killed the mastermind behind that attack was a man named mustafa sayan siddiqar the person who put out a video claiming that he was the one who plotted in detail the entire aps school attack umar mansoor right if the government of india and i know there are sections within the pakistani establishment and the non establishment which have you know accused at various points of time india and indian agencies being behind that attack now be that as it may i'm not even getting into that you know i'm not even you know uh, that that's not the subject of my question the subject of my question is if india were to decide to award a special position on human rights to the wife of Mustafa Sayan Siddiqar or the wife of Umar Mansoor would Pakistan sit quiet and accept would Pakistan say ha ha they are separate individuals they have nothing to do with their husbands and they you know should be given what should, they should be given w- would it be acceptable Zakai, to you yes yes i i i completely received your question look i think i answered this earlier i think india can do whatever it likes to an indian citizen and give them whatsoever portfolio they like and they deem appropriate 
this is exactly what i have answered and this is exactly the answer to all your questions and all these uh, intriguing questions that you've been pointed towards mashal malik she is a pakistani okay uh, to us so, she has always advocated uh, so no let me ask in kashmir but she has advocated the un resolution fair of enough so let me ask uh, kavinder gupta ji kavinder yes, gupta ji मुना आलम yes, का कहना ये है और पाकिस्तानी सरकार की कहना ये है कि इसमें भारत का क्या लेना देना है मुशाल मलिक जो है वो पाकिस्तानी नागरिक है वो पाकिस्तानी सिटीजन है पाकिस्तान उनको क्या कोई रिवॉर्ड दे सके या उनको कोई पोजीशन या पद दे दे उसमें किसको मतलब भारत को क्यों इतराज़ होना चाहिए क्योंकि ये भारत का अंदरूनी मामला नहीं है ये पाकिस्तान का अंदरूनी मामला है तो इसके ऊपर आप क्या प्रतिक्रिया देंगे और दूसरी चीज अभी तक तो भारत के साइड की तरफ से आ, और भारत की तरफ से कोई रिएक्शन भी नहीं आया है या कोई प्रतिक्रिया भी नहीं आया है या या भी सरकार की तरफ से या एम की तरफ से या इवन सोर्स बेस्ड कोई भी प्रतिक्रिया नहीं आया है कि इसके खिलाफ आप कुछ बोलेंगे कुछ करेंगे कुछ नहीं देखिए दो चीजें हैं नंबर एक तो ये विश्व मंच पर इसको बार बार हम कह रहे कहते हैं और पाकिस्तान उस वक्त ये बात मानता भी है लेकिन उसने कभी इस पर कार्रवाई ना की ना की है जो भी आतंकवादी जिनको चिन्हित कर दिया है आइडेंटिफाई कर दिया है जो डिक्लेयर हो चुके हैं उनके खिलाफ भी कोई एक्शन नहीं लेता जब बड़ा प्रेशर अमरीका या दूसरे देशों का पड़ता है तो उस, उस, उस समय ये सिर्फ नाम के लिए वो एक रिपोर्ट दर्ज करके या इसको झूठ कह करके इस प्रकार की बातें करता है लेकिन भारत अपने आप में सक्षम है जब कोई अगर कोई भी गलत कार्रवाई करेगा भारत ने किस वक्त उसका जवाब देना है हम अच्छी तरह से जानते हैं और किया भी है दूसरी बात ये है कि पाकिस्तान जो बार बार कभी बार बात करने की वकालत करता है या कुछ कहता है इससे रिश्ते बिगड़ते हैं ना तो रिश्ते ठीक होने वाले हैं क्योंकि पाकिस्तान पर कभी विश्वास किया ही नहीं जा सकता पाकिस्तान डज समथिंग इट एलिविएट्स द सिचुएशन टेम्परेली और उसके बाद जो वो करता आ रहा है वो करते रहेंगे नाउ माय पॉइंट इज इवन द रीसेंट एग्जांपल ऑफ द तहावर राना केस यू हैव अ डिप्लोमैट इन पाकिस्तान इन द फॉरेन मिनिस्ट्री देयर राइटिंग टू हिज काउंटर पार्ट राइटिंग टू हिज कॉलीग इन द मिशन इन वाशिंगटन डीसी आस्किंग यू नो वॉट इज हैपनिंग ऑन दिस तहावर राना केस वी कॉन्ट अफोर्ड टू अलाउ हिम टू बी एक्सट्राडाइटेड टू इंडिया एट एनी कॉस्ट नाउ अगेन द पॉइंट आई एम मेकिंग इज if america gets involved and if america you know reads out the riot act to pakistan then maybe they might consider do something doing something but otherwise what leverage do we have the zakra uh, pakistan uh, definitely uh, the establishment there um, uh, uh, has been a, a, a what do you call a is a, 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 a uh america's uh, you know uh, whatever america says uh, pakistan uh, generally listens that it it, in, it wields lot of influence on pakistan's establishment because uh, whatever happened in afghanistan against russians all happened at the behest of cia of the america but uh, uh, you know uh, uh, about the habur uh, rana yeah uh, what is a uh, chor ke man mein kala what is the problem with uh, pakistan why why is it so scared that if we if 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 america uh, deports him to uh, india and he is brought to justice here what what is that secret which pakistan is scared of that yeah. it will he will reveal so that yeah, shows what, that shows what pakistan is scared of because all the planning was uh rakti was done by him uh, the mumbai attack was executed after that by pa- 10 pakistanis we all know about that okay so uh, lalit ambardar final word i've got 30 seconds to wrap up how should india respond to this should india just ignore sure. this and pretend like nothing has happened and not respond at all or should india actually make a big deal out of this and and respond to it in measure 
No. I don't think Indian state should take it up so seriously and give a statement on that. What they can do is that we, we must realize that we have a Molly called in Kashmiri terrorist. Mm -hmm. Till now this Yasin Malik was treated till 2014, he was treated as if he was the head of a state. Similarly other terrorists also. So I expect government of India at this moment to, to officially acknowledge what Kashmiri Hindus suffered was genocide and put up a tribunal and haul them everybody, including those in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, the mainstream polity and uh, investigate their involvement. So that you can have a counter narrative, otherwise what, what will you say? You send Yasin Malik on a bus ride to Pakistan and he he himself created a faux pas when he was pa passing through a particular place uh, this is where uh, Sheikh this is uh, where we got the terrorist training in Pakistan this is okay. what we have been doing I think we need to even not one Kashmiri I repeat not even one Kashmiri terrorist has been has been ever charged for Kashmiri Hindu genocide recently can you imagine a mother a, a recently uh, the ex uh, inspector general of police Mason Sahai he revealed recently a mother and daughter were raped and shot in vagina and nonchalantly, this police officer says, where will we find them, those guys? And the, my Supreme Court says, uh, where will we find the evidence? This is what I say. We have been morally calling Kashmiri Jazdis because we thought, but well, you want to keep the Kashmir because we want to keep the happy, this terrorist happy. But now I'm glad right. the actions are being taken, but it will not be complete till you set up a tribunal to in in investigate the crimes committed okay. against Kashmiri Hindus. All right. This will set up uh, in Pakistan Gupta, as well as the growing Vaid, Mona Mona Alam, the of India. And of course, Saifuddin Sosab, thank you very much for speaking with us. Uh, it is rather unfortunate that things have come to such a pass where the wife of a convicted terrorist is being awarded not just any position, not just a ministerial position, but a position as director of the Special Office for Human Rights to the Prime Minister of Pakistan. All right, let's uh, shift focus. Uh, I'm going to leave you with the conversation that I had with Nalan Mehta. He's our CNN News 18 expert, a political expert. He's also a research scholar, an academic. He's come out with a new book called India's Decade, the Decade of Technology, which delves into the story of India's digital revolution and the transformative impact that it's had on society and in politics. This fascinating conversation coming up in just a moment. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'll catch you again Monday night, same time. Good night. So India over the last decade has seen a fascinating journey, a revolution of sorts in the digital realm from less than 200 million smartphones at the start of the decade to now almost 750 million smartphones. 40% of the world's digital financial transactions every month happen right here in India. So how did this transformation come about and what does the next technological decade or the decade look like. Joining us now is the author of this fascinating new book, India's Decade, Nalan Mehta. Thank you very much for uh, joining us for this conversation here on CNN News 18. First things first, this book, India's Decade, uh, this is what, your fifth or sixth? <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, what, what, I mean, you're not a techie. So what, what inspired you or what was the germ of the idea for you to write something on the technological transformation? Um, thanks very much, Saka, for that introduction. Um, why did I write this book? Essentially because, you know, we are so used to now, uh, we go out and we use the phone and use UPI and for everything from, from big department stores to the Sabziwala to, uh, to other places. See, in 2000, last year, I traveled about 2000 kilometers across UP. Um, and I was carrying a lot of cash with me in one of the most backward areas, thinking that I would need that cash covering the election. Yeah. I came back without spending a single paisa, because and we were staying in the in the you know back of the beyond and backward places, uh, in uh, both economically and socially. Um, and everywhere uh, the UPI worked, the phone worked as a form of currency. That completely knocked my socks off. You know, I didn't expect that to see in some of the most backward regions of the country. And I think there is a much deeper story here. Uh, over the last 10, 12, 13 years, I think in, we've, uh, see, we think of technical uh, innovation as synonymous with Silicon Valley yeah. or more broadly with the West. Yeah. I think what India has done on a scale never seen before is a digital revolution which is different because it has been enabled by the state. Mm. Uh, not just, not simply by the private sector alone. It's been enabled by the state, it's been created by some of the, uh, seeded by some of the institutions of the state. Mm. Um, and it's been done on a scale that has never happened before and gone viral. Yeah. UPI is just one example of that. Yeah. Yeah. And three things, um, Zaka, um, um, the combination of the cheap mobile phone, cheap data and a unique digital ID system enabled this. Mm. Why I wrote, I thought, um, because this is unprecedented, I think this has huge implications for our politics 
for our economy, for the relation, how citizens engage with each other, how the government relates to its poorest. The relationship has changed because it's changed the way we work our welfare systems yeah. and the hinges of the economy through UPI and so on. It also has huge global ramifications um, with uh, digital public infrastructure of a kind that has now been built up. Something at last count, something like 70 plus countries have been talking to India, uh, expressing interest in deal in how to export UPI, this. Yeah. So, I think there's a story that we must tell about India. So, but tell me, you know, I, I think there's some chart in, in, in your book which indicates this as well. Is there a direct correlation? And I'm just curious to know where was this inflection point hmm. where, you know, the number of smartphone users increased exponentially and the price of data also fell pretty exponentially. I mean, is there a, a correlation between how Absolutely. the price fell and how... Absolutely. I, I think India benefited from... a. Uh, uh, inflection point of the coming together of these three things: the uh, the smartphone, the cheap di cheap smartphone. Yeah. See, mobile phones have been around since the late mid sure. 90s, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, we all remember how when it used to be so ex of, of our generation, at least when phones used making phone calls to be so expensive, data was a different thing. The inflection point is around 2015. Okay. If you if you map on a graph the the price of smartphones, yeah. uh, the price of of of, uh, of uh, uh, average data per user per per, per per month and all of that, you can see around 2015, geo comes in. And that there's a pre-geo era and there's a post-geo era. Once that happens, you combine that with a unique ID system. See, okay. Aadhaar by itself mm. would not have uh, done yeah. much. You combine these three and then that gives you scale. Because the real issues of a digital divide. Mm. Otherwise, all these tech stuff, you know, they look good on a PowerPoint. Mm. They look good in tech, um, uh, you know, startup uh, founders rooms. Yeah. But how do you take it? To Barabanki. So, so when did that mass consumption of technology start? I mean, some say maybe it was demonetization. Suddenly, overnight, there was no currency, there was no cash to use. That's when your big, you know, uh, uh, digital financial players became active. Some say it was COVID. You couldn't move. You couldn't, you know, get out of your house. So that's what enabled uh, financial transactions. So where was the, the, the that sort so of? So I would moment? argue that the digital divide was a real thing in India. Mm -hmm. But I think the digital divide today is far more irrelevant today than it ever was before. Why uh, do you say that? Simple, look at the data. Google will tell you 45% of, uh, well, uh, of, of all Indian, uh, well, not Google, sorry, 45% of mobiles in this country are now in rural areas. Okay. Uh, something like uh, one third of every Indian rural India now connected to a phone and to data directly. Um, if you look at searches uh, in Google, a uh, significant number of them come from you famously what is Bharat from okay. rural India, right? In voice search, over 90% comes from rural India. Now, between 2014 15, because by then the system scaffolding, I mean, you know, it's like when you make a tech product, it's like a build. Aadhaar comes yeah. in, the cheap mobile phone, all of these things come in. Over a period of time, Common service centers are built across villages, uh, about five, five and a half lakh gram panchayas they are built. That allows you, allows people, uh, the jam thing happens yeah. uh, uh, around 15, 16. That brings uh, something like half a billion people into the financial system in a way that they simply weren't before. Um, uh, and that allows you to create a direct benefit transfer system of a kind that has not been seen before. The biggest, every government before this has spent money on welfare. Yeah, correct. The problem is the Indian state knew the poor didn't know how to find them. Yeah. Now, what's and all, it's not perfect. It is far more efficient than ever before. And that has led, and that can be used by both um, BJP, but also non-BJP states. State sure. governments, central governments, both have been using direct benefit transfers. Correct. I would say, and you mentioned COVID, you had something like 80 crore people mm. benefiting from money in their account during the COVID period. Correct. We saw the deprivations in the COVID period. We saw the dead bodies in the Ganga. We, I mean, uh, that was real suffering. I would argue one of the reasons why we didn't have political upheavals of the kind that could have been expected after an upheaval of that kind was precisely because you had a new kind of social welfare uh, net that was built up because of this tech which was put up and COVID was the proof of that. Of that. But, but tell me something, I mean, uh, because you said digital divide is today far more irrelevant than yeah. it was perhaps say a decade ago, but we saw this in COVID as well and most, you know, um, in, in the most exemplary fashion in the case of students, hmm. right, uh, learning from home. Uh, the ones who had access to a laptop and internet connection at home, they were seen as the privileged class. Mm. And there, were, there was a large that's section true. of students who didn't ac have access to this. So are you saying that that situation has now changed in the three years since COVID? Or if, let's say, God forbid, another COVID were to happen, mm. you wouldn't see that kind of a digital divide uh, today? I'm saying that 
I don't think we we should uh, we can underplay the differences in our society sure. uh, in terms of class and so on. Though they exist, uh, I think privileged children had it far better, of course, because of mobile phones and so on. What I'm saying is the difference today is significantly different from what it was six or seven or eight years ago, and that has allowed us. See, you'll see progress over the next 15 years. Yeah, yeah, what we've seen in the last eight years is, is a paradigmic shift, mm -hmm. and I think it's like you see a glass half full, glass half empty, right? Um, the glass half full is something that was unimaginable even five years ago. We didn't imagine the kind of virality a UPI would have even six, seven years ago. It looked like science fiction. Yeah. Direct benefit transfers looked like you know some idea. By policy wonks, it would. It was never meant. It was nobody thought it would become the real of the way it had. I am saying that allows us the possibilities in a country like ours with the challenges that we face that we never thought were possible to solve. Of course, a lot more needs to be done. For example, uh, fraud has to be removed. Oh, there yeah. is still a lot of duplication. Uh, uh, they, they see the number of Russian cards that have been found to be duplicates, the number of yeah. Aadhaar cards that were duplicate. A lot of that has to, that Still qualitative thing has out. to happen. But let me get one, one thought from you on, on this jam trinity that yeah. you talked about and the government also keeps talking about it. Uh, what is so different about it from the point of view of how that has been able to plug leakages from the famous Rajiv Gandhi statement that for every rupee that the government sends to the poor, 85 paise is taken by middlemen, only 15 paise reaches the poor. How is that changed because of this jam trinity? Uh, very simple. Um, Direct benefit, uh, when Aadhaar was set up uh, uh, by the Manmohan Singh regime, uh, there was a, uh, there was a um, debate after Modi took over in 2014 on whether Aadhaar will continue or not. I mean, yeah. a lot of people thought Aadhaar won't survive. A decision is taken somewhere around July 2014 by the Modi regime to continue this and to double down on it. Once that happens, look at the numbers. You have seen in terms of direct benefit transfers, in 11x growth, including the Manmohan Singh period and now, between 2013-14 to 22-23, 11x growth in terms of number of schemes that were applicable, mm. uh, 8x growth in terms of the beneficiaries, went up from 10.8 crores to somewhere around 92.3 crore beneficiaries by 2022-23. In terms of the actual money, it went up by 110 times, uh, from 7,000 crores in 2013 uh, 14, 7,367 crores to be precise, to, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, 8, 8 13,287 crores if you, uh, if you take ben benefits in kind as well. Mm. What has happened in this period is that so many more people came into your safety net that simply was not possible earlier. Yeah. Now, that to me, the government says, now initially, uh, the government said this also takes away leakages. I'll give you an example. Typically, in a in a in a gram panchayat, um, if people always had to pay bribes yeah. to uh, to be eligible for a government scheme. I'm not saying bribery has gone away. Mm -hmm. So typically it will be five stages, right? It'll go from yeah. central to state. State will give aage. It'll go to the gram panchayat head. It'll, uh, it'll go niche. Um, I spoke to a gram panchayat head in Western UP, and he gave me a very I'm from a Samajwadi party, and he gave me a very good example. He said, look. He was not happy about it. He said, look, the biggest problem <laughs> is our we can only adjudicate somebody's name based on the SECC uh, census. Yes. When that name comes, the money goes directly into that person's account. We have no role. Yeah. Sometimes the bribery still happens because somebody still has to pay money because if I am a beneficiary yeah. and I you are the you are the gram panchayat head, I may pay still pay you some money because um, I want you to make me eligible for the other scheme also. Correct. But earlier, uh, if, if you I was to pay paying money you, to get money, exactly. exactly. The problem is, but now the money has come into my account. Yes. So the power equation has shifted. Earlier, changed. I was my hand fell out. You have to pay me. Correct. Now, money has come. So the equation has changed on the ground, and that I think is an underestimated revolution. Okay. It, it extends from central government schemes like PM Kisan to PM Abhas Yojana to state government schemes of like Raitu Bandhu in, in, in uh, the Kisan Telangana, scheme yeah. in Telangana uh, to other schemes in West Bengal to other schemes in Tamil Nadu. I think this has has, has had a huge social ramification on the ground. Okay. And leakages about 25,000 crores have been shut out. So let me get a, a final word. This is about India's decade. Hmm. What about the next decade? I mean, where does India go from here? Because there are two parts to this question. One is Yes, we have about 50,000 plus startups now. It's one of the biggest startup ecosystems in the world. Uh, but startups are also facing a bit of a, a funding winter, if you yeah. will, right? A lot of startups have had to lay off people and so on. And ultimately, you know, directionally, let's say the decadal journey, 
are you going to see Indian companies in a position to take on, let's say, the Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world, the Apples of the world, the biggest tech companies in the world? I mean, today we are in an age of chat GPT. Hmm. It's all still coming out from Silicon Valley. Hmm. How does that change and when does that change? I think that is a million dollar question. Um, uh, I think we have significant challenges to, I mean, can that change? Yes, so this is a question that was put up yesterday. Vijay Shekhar Sharma of Paytm said, absolutely, in, you know, in four or five years, you will see, see something yeah. like that. Um, one of the, uh, I think we have, with, with digital public infrastructure in particular, one of the challenges that will come up for India, which we must solve, is, is the role of the state. Mm. Um, um, you know, it has often been said when the state stays away, those are sectors yeah. that go ahead. That happened with IT, yeah, that happened yeah, with yeah. the startup ecosystem and so on. With digital public infrastructure, uh, for example, by Aadhaar, or when you take it overseas, you will probably have to create some kind of common, global commons. You'll probably have to create independent structures which people will have far m even more faith in because mm. when the state is involved, how much of state overreach do you have? Yeah. Those are issues that are evolving right now. I think how we resolve those as a society, as as a st uh, as with the state and civil society and the, the private sector is what will define many of these things. Sure. All right. Nalan Mehta is always a fascinating conversation and good luck on this new book, India's Ticket. I'm sure going <laughs> to read my copy. So Thank if we've been much. tuned in to this uh, conversation, thank you very much. We'll see you again next time. Welcome back. You're watching CNN News 18. This is Nation at 5 and we are on the cusp of history. In five days from now, India is going to attempt soft landing on the lunar surface. This is going to happen on the south side of the moon, something that hasn't been attempted at all before. We might see Russia do it a few days before us, but the window for Russia's Luna 25 is still not fixed. India could very well be the first country that lands on the south side of the lunar surface, the dark side as it's called. There have been several maneuvers that have taken place as far as the Chandrayaan-3 mission goes. All of them successful so far. One such maneuver was conducted by ISRO just a short while ago. That is the de-boosting maneuver. Let's take a look at what exactly this maneuver means. The de-boosting maneuver talks about how uh, the lander and the orbit, uh, the lander and the rover are now much, much closer to the moon. So, what it is, uh, is ha going to happen now is that they are in a uh 30 kilometers by 100 kilometers orbit as far as the moon is concerned which is only going to help the lander which is Vikram along with rover Pragyan to attempt that soft landing on 23rd of August at 5.47 p.m. What this de-boosting maneuver has ensured is that the pace of Vikram the lander has now been reduced so that it eventually can turn its position from being horizontal to become vertical and then actually land on the surface of the moon. Remember, the landing is very, very crucial because this is where Chandrayaan 2 failed a few years ago. We've learned from those mistakes, which is why this deboosting procedure was undertaken by ISRO. There is another deboosting maneuver that is going to take place on the 20th of August in two days from now, three days before we attempt that soft landing on the south side of the moon. It is a great achievement for ISRO. A billion hopes are riding on Vikram and Pragyan, the rover. India is praying for triumph. Presented by Our uh, aspect itself hmm. gets demolished with the appointment of Mrs. Malik as part of uh, the special team of the uh, of the caretaker prime minister. All these appointments are done by the military deep state. Technically, now until February, till there are elections in Pakistan, 
it's the military deep state and the military establishment that is quasi running affairs in pakistan and if these are their priorities one only knows what their intent is and what their intentions are so this is also an, uh, a, a message to the indian polity hmm. that there cannot be any talking peace with pakistan right and anand if we specifically talk about its association with the isi this essentially is also being looked at as pakistan prime minister's office bid to save isi from being irrelevant or completely non performing how does one associate these two aspects when it is about the appointment of mushal malik well the isi has had a string of failures first up they had no clue that 370 is being abrogated and they couldn't do anything over the last 4 years whatever they have tried has failed they are losing any kind of uh, support on ground because that narrative has failed so much so in pak occupied jammu and kashmir uh, all the way up to baltistan and gilgit all those regions there are people who are turning around and saying we are better off with india we don't want you anymore and the the atrocities the entire coinage of ye jo dehshat gardi hai iske piche vardi hai has been coined in pojk itself and it's aimed at the pakistan military establishment so it's a it's a true of slew of setbacks for the isi to the level to which that the arab nations the islamic nations and uh, the erstwhile ally america they've all turned their backs and saying this is all a dead thing and you have not been you have been proven ineffective so for the isi this is very bad pr so this is one last desperate attempt to try and get some uh, some currency they are hoping that mushal malik could go there and perhaps raise some funds for them for their so called jihad and also raise funds from nations who may find certain empathy or she may be able to evoke certain amount of empathy or sympathy from them but again the uh, indian Inter indian side or the intel sources uh, here believe it's a lost cause it's not going to put any ill more on that they have actually stamped uh, their approval on all ter terrorism that has been fomented on indian soil having state backing this move itself shows that pakistan's activity on indian soil is state backed there is yes. no thing no concept of non state actors at all Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Anand, and explaining that point beautifully. When it is about the appointment of Munshial Malik, as far as the caretaker cabinet in Pakistan is concerned, we have our eyes on the story. The India Association, however, right now is not getting much response. We did try to actually pose that question to Mehbooba Mufti, but she has decided to stick to what concerns the country and not what is happening in Pakistan. We leave it at that. We are slipping into a very, very short break. We're coming right back with lots more that's happening on CNN News 18. The CNN. News 18 exclusive. Now we are learning that Mushal Malik's entry to Pakistan PMO is just to give a face saving to ISI. And this is as per sources we are given to understand that Mushal Malik has been very closely working with the top brass of the Pakistani army and also the ISI. I have my colleague Anand Narsimhan to offer more perspective on this big piece of breaking news that we have on the broadcast. But before we go to him, let's actually offer more uh, inputs on what we are learning through this exclusive news break. Now we are given to understand that Mushal Malik was working for the Kashmir division of the ISI very, very closely. Remember, Yasin Malik has been detained. He has been sentenced to life imprisonment in a terror funding case in Kashmir. We are also given to understand that uh, Mushal Malik, in fact, stays in Islamabad, and sh this she does in an ISI safe house, and this has been on for a very, very long time. And uh, she's staying there with her young daughter, who has spoken against the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir Assembly, against India, and uh, we have these several instances that also talk about Mushal Malik her association with Pakistani army, and more importantly, Pakistan intelligence agency, the ISI. And the fact that she is working very, very closely on the Kashmir division of the ISI also raises a lot of eyebrows. Remember. This is also a major snap that the Pakistan uh, authorities are planning when it comes to India. Uh, the intel suggests that this was a strategic appointment as far as the caretaker uh, uh, cabinet in Pakistan is concerned, and that's why the appointment of Ma Mushal Malik becomes important. Two important points: her close association with the Pakistan Army and the ISI. My colleague Anand Narsimhan is with us. Yes, Anand. 
Well, Mushal Malik herself is uh, educated at the London School of Economics. Uh, she is a bright uh, person herself, no, no questions asked, but her connections with Yasin Malik and her actions, that's, where, uh, that's what turns the spotlight. The, if the JKLF has rushed to issue a statement against Mushal saying that she's got nothing to do with Yasin Malik, then we should know that she's got everything to do with him. They have a daughter, they got married in 2009, they have a daughter and mind you, the daughter also spoke in the POK assembly against India. So this is a narrative that's being pushed as our uh, group editor security Manuj Gupta is getting us the details. This is one last desperate bid by the ISI to try and steer the narrative and to try and rake up this entire Kashmir issue once again. A dead horse which they're trying to flog again and again and again and this is a desperate measure. What are they trying to Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Shep. The war in Ukraine has hit a stalemate. It's been like that for a while, but the West seems to be finally coming to terms with it. There is a new American assessment. It says Ukraine will not be able to retake any important city, at least this year, even as Ukraine's pilots start training on the F-16s. Western leaders could be nudging Kiev towards a compromise because after more than 500 days of fighting, the world is feeling the impact of this frozen